Right now on Colorado Point of View, it's crunch time for the state legislature here as this year's session ends in just a few weeks. Legislators making it clear from day one what they want to get done this year. My number one priority this session is to bring down the cost of living in Colorado. The Democrats have undermined law enforcement and allowed soft on crime policies to continue. Did the top Democrat and Republican in the House live up to those promises? I sit down with both to find out. Plus, after a summer of smog, lawmakers try to improve Colorado's air quality. That and more right here, right now on Colorado Point of View. Well, good morning, I'm Matt Morrow, and this is Colorado Point of View. The state capitol is about to get even busier as legislators have just a few weeks left to make new laws during this year's legislative session. The 73rd General Assembly is now set to adjourn on Wednesday, May 11th. You can see it right here, just a little more than two weeks remaining, and a lot of big issues still need to be addressed. Lawmakers just passed a $36.4 billion state budget. That is the biggest ever, up nearly $2 billion from last year. So where is all of that money going? The budget includes an increase of more than a billion dollars for the Department of Health Care Policy and Financing. The Education Department will also see a big increase of nearly 12 percent stripped out of the final budget, an extra 3 percent raise for state troopers. And right now, both parties are talking about trying to save you money. This past week, the House debated a bill that would temporarily suspend a new gas fee or tax, whatever you want to call it, that is set to go into effect in July. It's a fee that Democrats and one Republican passed last year, too. And as I quote the governor right here, fix the damn roads. We'll talk about that and much more coming up. And how could we forget the controversial Fentanyl Accountability Prevention Act? It went through some dramatic changes a little more than a week ago, including making it a felony to knowingly possess one gram or more of fentanyl rather than the four grams under the current law. One of the sponsors is of that bill is the Democrats top dog, the Speaker of the House, Alec Garnett. He joins me here now. Mr. Speaker, thanks so much for being here. I appreciate it. Matt, thanks so much for having me on. Let's get right to fentanyl. I want you to listen what, to what Governor Jared Polis said just the other day about fentanyl on Colorado Public Radio's Colorado Matters with Ryan Warner. Polis called it a poison, and then he said this. Listen. So you think of it more like anthrax. You don't say, okay, you have anthrax. We're going to, you know, send you to a place where we convince you not to have anthrax. You say, you have anthrax. That could, you know, do you realize that one gram of fentanyl can kill over a thousand people? That's what we're talking about here. I mean, this is not cocaine. This is not even meth. The governor is comparing it to anthrax, which is incredibly deadly. One spore can kill a ton of people. Um, your bill that you have right now, are you short strong enough to stop the more than two people a day from dying of fentanyl overdoses in Colorado that we have right now? Yeah, thanks, Matt. There, you know, the bill that's before the legislature right now is a bipartisan approach to making sure that we do two things, that we hold those dealers who are dealing the deadly uh, fentanyl uh, pills and compound mixtures accountable for what they are peddling on the streets and that we get harm reduction resources on the ground to save lives. And so right now, I think we can all agree, Democrats and Republicans, that we want to save lives. There has been an increased attention on possession. What I will say is all law enforcement, uh, all harm reductionists agree that whatever we do on on possession isn't going to solve the problem. But I do think that where the bill is now is a responsible step forward to one, make sure that we are not criminalizing addiction and disease, but that we're getting pills off the street. Would it be better, some law enforcement uh, agents, a lot of prosecutors say, let's just make it zero. You have any fentanyl, it's a felony, and then we can work with people who are, say, users of these drugs, people who take it and they don't realize it, versus people who are dealing it and have dozens or hundreds of pills at a time. So the, uh, the penalties for dealers who are, uh, have any amount of fentanyl on them at all that they are knowingly possessing with the intent to distribute to people, uh, those penalties are stronger in this bill than in any other bill that the state legislature has seen. It's important to highlight that no Democrat or Republican has moved forward on a bill this year, even though each member gets to introduce five bills to touch on possession. However, moving uh, in this bill to where we are in possession, I think is a responsible step forward. I think if you go to zero, what you end up doing is you end up criminalizing uh, people who are suffering from substance uh, use disorders and our criminal justice system isn't equipped at the moment to help handle those people who are suffering from addiction and uh, but getting to one is going to get pills off the street it's going to give law enforcement more tools and it's going to help protect our communities and save lives 
A lot of talk about the current bill and what the legislature is talking about right now it goes back to a 2019 bill that made having four grams or less of most drugs, including fentanyl, a misdemeanor. You supported that. A lot of Democrats did. Uh, a Republican did as well. Do you regret that now? Uh, there was more, way more than uh, one Republican. Uh, there was a lot of bipartisan support for that bill. I think at the time in 2019, um, most of us, I don't think, understood what fentanyl was. I think it's fair to say that four grams of fentanyl is too much fentanyl. I think everyone that I've talked to, uh, when it comes to personal use, uh, believes that having 40 pills in, in someone's pocket is not personal use. And so I think that's really what we're doing here, is we're realigning the cut points in state statute to better reflect uh, where uh, people are at right now in regards to fentanyl. Okay, let's go back to some of your priorities. You talked about these as a legislative session began back in January. Listen. My number one priority this session is to bring down the cost of living in Colorado and make life more affordable for families in our state. That's a priority for a lot of people, especially with inflation right now here in Colorado, up 9.1% since the last year. Do you think you've lived up to the priority, and if so, how? Um, I'm, ass I'm assuming that was saving people money since I wasn't yes. able to hear the recording. Oh, I apologize. Um, yes, you uh, said my number one priority this session is to bring down the cost of yeah. living in Colorado and make life more affordable for families in our state. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, when it comes to the state legislature, we only have, have so many tools in order to help save people money. The inflationary pressures that Colorado families are having are due to powers that are outside of our control. However, when you look at what this legislature has done to step up and uh, save people money, it's to the tune of over a hundred and seventy million dollars and in a state that has as small and tight uh, a budget as Colorado does that is an incredible investment from this year's legislature to help meet people where they are we know that people are uh, tight that people are trying to uh, make ends meet and we are stepping up uh, whether or not it's if you're a nurse, if you're an educator, if you are tr trying to start your, sm your own small business, or whether or not it's on child care, uh, we are helping you save money. All right, what one bill specifically that is helping the average person, the average family here in Colorado save money today or when the bill goes into law? Yeah, I mean, one of the uh, biggest investments that we're making is in affordable housing. I think housing is pinching Colorado families in every region of this state. I think one thing that I would challenge the Republican Party on and, and your next guest, uh, Hugh McKean, is why there isn't more bipartisan support to get behind helping people afford housing here in the state of Colorado. All right, I wish we could talk more. Unfortunately, we're out of town. Uh, time, Speaker of the State House, Alec Garnett. Mr. Speaker, thanks so much for being here. I appreciate yeah. it. And as he mentioned, up next, the other side of the aisle. House Minority Leader Hugh McKean joins me with what Republicans have and want to get done in the final days of the session. We have been, as Republicans, focused on this. These are our big three. Make Colorado more affordable, get tough on crime, and make sure that parents have the educational choices for their kids. Well, that was House Minority Leader Hugh McKean back in January, right before the legislative session started. He joins me now to talk about that and more. Representative, thanks for being here. It's good to see you. Thanks for having me. Okay, you just heard what you had talked about. Three big things. Make Colorado more affordable, get tough on crime, and make sure parents have educational choices for their kids. Have you lived up to that? We are trying every day. And, and the thing is, we realize that we're in the minority. Right, and so we come with these ideas and we, we fight every day for, for our policy ideas. And we've put a lot of stuff on the floor. You know, we have brought uh, bills that would allow teachers to take a tax credit killed by the Democrats. It would um, let people take a tax deduction for paying rent killed by the Democrats. So we keep bringing our ideas time and again. And, and what we're really trying to do is make sure that we're bringing ideas. We're not just sitting there saying no to everything. We're sitting there saying, here are some really good things that'll save families money, do something about crime on our streets, and give parents some, some choice in their kids' education. You know, inflation is up 9.1% here in the Denver area year over year. Um, food is up basically almost a percent in the last two months. Energy is up 15% in the last two months. I know you can't fix supply chain issues. You can't fix whatever is going on nationally and internationally with oil and gas. But what can you do in the legislature to make Colorado more affordable for the people who are living here as the cost of living here is just out of control? It's out of control. It is so difficult to just get started here, just to be able to buy a home. Home and, and put on top of that, putting gas in your tank and buying milk and doing all the things you need to do. You know, we've put really good things on, on the ground, and one of the things is not legislatively. What we looked at was if, if we see gas prices escalating the way they are, if we see a war between Russia and Ukraine driving these costs up, 
why doesn't the governor say, let's just issue gas and oil exploration permits in 90 days? Everything is ready to go. Get it off the ground. We have got the molecule here in the ground in Colorado to help with those costs of, of petroleum. Others would say that there are a lot of permits, an awful lot of permits already issued here in Colorado that aren't being acted on by the oil and gas companies. So I've heard that, and one of the interesting things is there have to be a lot of permits. There are surface use permits, there are drilling permits, there are all these things. But what the oil and gas community says is, look, we've got tight regulations, and we're very, very willing to live within those, and we can do it well. What we really need is the surety of going out and exploring new projects and getting those in 90 days. Okay, on the idea of gas, one last question on this. Right now, there was a bill debated last week that would put off the fee or the tax, whatever you want to call it, that was passed last year, as the governor famously said, to quote, fix our damn roads. Uh, two cents per gallon, some other fees on um, Uber and Lyft rides and some deliveries. Do you support delaying this, in, at least in the short term? Well, it seems like a very short term, right? It seems like they're going to delay it until just after the election, which is kind of an interesting thing, right? So we're going to save you money, and we're going to make sure we get reelected and then we're going to rethink this whole thing. I think that's a real problem. And I think the real problem is that it's not real savings long term for people. You don't just delay a fee. All you're doing by delaying a fee is making somebody broke next year. So what we really need to see is comprehensive reform of what we do. You can make government run better and smaller and let's do it. Let's take this moment of inflation to say let's show the world that we're the most efficient that we can possibly be. But to put off the, the, the reduction, to only make it last until you get reelected and then pretty much the inauguration day of the of the new governor it would expire that seems a little disingenuous it, it might be that is a political point that can be debated but is it at least something to save people money today right now when they're really struggling you know i think that we look at all those things and and i want to save them money right now today but I want it to last. And I think that we could probably do a better job by making sure that what we're really doing is helping families and the companies they work for succeed and thrive. And that means pulling government back. Not so many regulations, not so many permits, not so many charges and fees. Just think about the unemployment insurance tax. Mm -hmm. That's going to skyrocket 72%. And so companies are going to have to decide, well, gosh, over here we're going to have to pay our unemployment insurance. Over here we'd like to give our raise to our employees. I think the employees should be getting that raise. All right, let's talk about fentanyl real quick. The new bill in the House, as it stands right now, would make it uh, a gram or more to be a felony rather than the four grams that it currently is. Do you support the bill as it is right now? So I think right now I think that it's a work in progress, and I, I would like to see it get to zero. I think fentanyl is one of, those, one of those drugs that you have to decide, do you want to get it off our streets or not? And that means zero tolerance in many ways. However, I think the discussion's bigger than that. Back in, in 2019, they brought 1263, the bill that defelonized these drugs. Mm -hmm. um, I fought against it. I was on Judiciary Committee. The very next year, I brought a bill of repeal to repeal the whole thing. It was killed. This year, I think we come to the problem that was created from that, which is that fentanyl and other drugs have more penetration in our communities than ever before. The governor's right. This is a poison. This is a poison that's killing our kids. The way I describe it is parents are laying in bed at night and just waiting to hear if the garage door goes up because they don't know that their kids are going to make it at home. That is not okay. That's not a way for Colorado to live. So yes or no on the bill as it stands right now. If it doesn't get to zero, is it better than nothing? It's better than nothing. I think there's still work to be done on it. All right. House Minority Leader Hugh McKean, we're out of time, unfortunately. Thank you, Thank you so, much, so much for being here, Representative. I appreciate it. Now let's talk about the air quality. You remember this. It was dangerous and unhealthy last summer. In fact, we had the most ozone action alert days since the state started tracking them back in 2011. Right now, political reporter Gabrielle Franklin is getting all points of view on some new bills that hope to change this. The governor and state lawmakers are looking to clean up Colorado's air through new legislation. We've had some of the dirtiest air in the world this past summer, right? We had the highest levels of ozone um, in, the, in the world. Our air was dirtier than Beijing's, right? And so that means that we've got to do everything that we can. A bill at the Capitol backed by Governor Polis would designate around $124 million grant dollars into efforts to improve air quality in the state. To me, making sure that our air quality um, is clean um, is, is, is paramount. The investments included in the package include $65 million for electric school buses, $25 million for businesses and local governments to reduce emissions and take part in renewable energy projects, $15 million for diesel truck emission reduction, $12 million to get more electric bikes in communities, and $7 million for air surveillance of pollutants. 
we're grateful to them, but much more does need to be done to be able to actually meet our greenhouse gas emission reduction goals. Sustainability advocacy groups like 350 Colorado say the bill is a good first step, but they like to see leaders go after bigger polluters. We need to address the fossil fuel production and extraction that's happening here in Colorado, which is actually the biggest source when you consider the exports of oil and gas. The biggest source by far is oil and gas fracking, and um, that's contributing, scientists say, from 40 to 50 percent of our air quality problem. And the measure already passed the Senate with widespread support. If it does the same in the House, the governor has already said that it's part of his legislative agenda to clean up the environment. He's expected to sign it. At the state capitol, Gabrielle Franklin, Colorado Point of View. And right now, Colorado could have one of the more competitive U.S. Senate races coming up for November. New federal reports show Senator Michael Bennett has millions of dollars more than any of his two GOP opponents for the primary. Our political panel breaks down the role money is going to play in the midterms and what that race looks like. Plus, CDOT is taking out the trash along the I-25 corridor. That and more in this week's Rocky Mountain Roundup. We are back with a Colorado point of view on the legislature, the U.S. Senate race for this state and more from our political analyst, Democratic strategist, White House and gubernatorial advisor Andy Boyan, along with Republican strategist and the director of the Advanced Colorado Institute, Michael Fields. Gentlemen, it's good to see you. you Thank too, you so man. much for being Thank here. Um, earlier this week, I asked both of you to grade how you think the session has gone so far. Let's take a look at what you say. Andy, you give it a B. Uh, Michael Fields, it's barely a passing grade. I know that from experience at a D minus. <laughs> um, Andy, let's start with you. The Democrats control it all. The House, the Senate, the governor's office. Why just a B? You know, we, we, uh, we have done a very good job in a number of places, I think, in terms of coming with ideas, with strong support, and with, as the speaker just said, some bipartisan answers um, in some very good ways. We've got some work to do, though. I mean, we are in charge, and the party in charge is always going to be the party that's going to be looked at as, as true leadership and, and bringing good, thoughtful ideas forward. Um, the problem is we don't have a lot of agreement on the other side, not a lot of willingness to work with us on the other side, so we've got some contention back and forth, and I think we could do better there. But I think both parties have some responsibility. But, uh, but a B, I think, is a solid grade so far. We've got a bit to go, though. Okay. A couple more weeks. You know, it's always a rush to get everything done. There will be a lot more bills passed. Michael, why a D minus? Well, you look at just that they failed at what they said their number one priority was, which was lowering the cost of living, saving people money. Uh, you look at our costs are, are higher than ever. Inflation is worse here in Colorado than it is uh, nationwide. And the budget is $2.3 billion bigger than it was last year. That's money that's not in taxpayers' pockets. That's in government pockets. And then on public safety, they've also, I think, failed. There's a half measure going through on fentanyl right now. You have violent criminals who are getting out after only 40 percent of their sentence. Uh, you know, Republicans did bring forward 44 bills to address these issues. Democrats shot them down. And so I think there's leadership that's needed right now. It's a crucial time for Colorado. It's not happening at the legislature. Is there one bill both of you can agree on and say this is one we need to pass in the next two weeks? Well, I think the fentanyl bill has to be passed, and it has to be passed, uh, I think, with, with any possession being a, a felony, and it's going to be on the floor uh, you know, very soon, and it's going to move over to the Senate, and I think that it's something that could get done, and it should get done. It'll be, it'll be on the floor in the next few days. It'll get over to the Senate. It has to be done. There is absolutely, unequivocally, no question that it has to be done. It has to be done now, and it has to, we have to show the country we are a leader here uh, on, the, on this issue, without a doubt. A lot of people hope so. Uh, also, for the second national election in a row, all eyes are going to be on Colorado as the state is once again going to help determine which party controls the U.S. Senate. Take a look today. New numbers are out about how much cash the candidates have right now. The Democrat and incumbent Senator Michael Bennett has a huge lead over his two Republican challengers, Joe Day and Ron Hanks. Many analysts do believe, though, that Colorado's seat remains quite competitive in the November midterms. In fact, the Cook political report, widely respected by both sides, recently downgraded Bennett's seat from solid Democrat to likely Democrat Michael, it's going to take a lot more money, and especially when you look at the two Republicans are going to spend some here in the primary before June. Yeah, they're going to have to. Uh, you have two candidates on, and fundraising shows are you a serious candidate or not. And if you look at Ron Hanks numbers, for example, $16,000 doesn't show that you're a serious candidate. It's yeah, somebody he overwhelmingly who, won at the it, Republican it's somebody assembly. somebody who's, who's running on one issue and had a plan to get through the assembly, but doesn't look like he has a plan beyond that. And so you look at somebody like Joe O'Day, who's a common sense conservative who's going to raise enough money in order to do it. Uh, you can see Bennett's uh, campaigns are ready 
already uh, scared of that as a race. And so I think this is going to be competitive just because of what is happening nationally. Uh, and the fact that a third of, of Coloradans don't have an opinion about Michael Bennett, which is bad in a year when Democrats aren't doing well. So I think it's going to be a competitive race come November. Even though when Bennett run, ran and won back in 2016, he had 1.36 million votes at that time, more than any other Democrat ever in a statewide race in That's Colorado. Right. That's right. Yeah, I mean, I think you look at it, every year is different, right? And this is not going to be the same year that Jared Polish ran in in 2018. Uh, you know, Michael Bennett won by five points against somebody who wasn't well-funded and, and in a bad year. So I, I think this is going to be a close race. Look, Bennett is still favored, um, but if, they, if, if Republicans put up somebody like Joe O'Day, uh, who is, you know, a mainstream conservative who can raise money, it's going to be laughable. a close race. I think it's laughable. The, the, the Republican National Committee isn't even going to focus on Colorado. And Hank's race. Even six, though Senator Rick Scott was here yeah. just last just week, they, they, they will not they a million dollars. On. <laughs> they won't over the long term because they know T Hanks can't win. He overwhelmingly won at their assembly. He is calling out for the revocation of the ACA. The guy's a nut job. And then overwhelmingly, Tina Peters wins at the, at the state at the state assembly as well. It shows that the party is far right of where the mainstream is. Yeah. They're out of. They're completely out of touch. This is a couple Doesn't thousand people. Doesn't make any people. sense. It's a couple and Michael thousand people. He's done an incredible job so far, and neither Republican candidate has shown any any muster at all. Yes or no? Joe Biden, the president's. Bad approval ratings hurt the senator in this race. I don't think it's a great help, but it also doesn't hurt, no. Okay. Andy Boyne, Michael Fields, gentlemen, thank you. Right now, CDOT thank workers you. are cleaning up trash along I-25, but it is costing you, the taxpayer. New numbers show just how much fentanyl enforcement is getting off the streets on the western slope. Let's get to the Rocky Mountain Roundup. I'm Ashley Nanfria with Fox 21 in Colorado Springs. CDOT crews spend their Monday cleaning up I-25 from Trinidad to Monument, as well as Highway 50. Normally, it's the maintenance team, but everyone from the office in southern Colorado rolled up their sleeves to pick up trash. It comes at a cost to taxpayers to get crews out to clean up. That all adds up, right? So you get one napkin from one person, a bag of trash from another person, and then you get people dumping their old furniture, their TVs, and everything else on the side of the road it adds up and it's a it costs the taxpayers a lot of money for us to be doing this i'm ashley nanfria colorado point of view and that'll do it for colorado point of view on this sunday i'm matt morrow thank you so much for joining us i'll see you back here next week